hopefully get on with the next and complex part of our program. Um, introduce uh, Chris Shelton again, Christian Shurko. Um, Christian is going to be our, our victim for the day. Uh, sorry, pre-clear. <laughs> I get those confused. Um, I have a tiny little preamble that I, I have here. Scientology is an immense and often confusing subject. So I want to go back again to the proposed objective of Scientology. I mean, there are millions of words in Scientology, but in fact, there is only one place that you're meant to be going, and that is exteriorization, which, as I said yesterday, is getting out of your mind, getting out of your head. And that is defined as the state of the Thetan, the spirit, the individual himself being outside his body. Um, Hubbard promised that at the far end of his Scientology bridge, the individual will be an operating Thetan, which is to say, be able to act independently from a human body, to travel anywhere in the universe and cause events to occur by willpower alone. Now, Scientology, I, I remember visiting uh, the Cult Awareness Network back in the 80s in, in Los Angeles and, and being told that there were 2,000 destructive cults. And, and I'm going to pick up on this word cult. It's not pejorative. Look it up in the dictionary. It's been with us for hundreds of years. It just means a group that follows a leader, pretty much. So Christianity was the cult of Jesus. There's, there's nothing pejorative about that. A destructive cult, however, or a totalist or totalitarian cult, which is what we're talking about. In fact, I remember Steve in, in 1989 picking up on this and saying, you have to say dangerous cult, not just cult, um, which is actually absolutely correct, whereas new religious movement doesn't really apply to most of the groups that are called that, like Est, for example, which has no religious pretensions. Bless the sociologists. But while most cults have just a couple of techniques, or maybe three, you know, transcendental meditation, you sit down and recite the name of a demon to yourself until you go into a trance. Which you don't know is the name of a... Demon. Yeah, they're not very, not very honest about that, and you're told you must not tell anybody what it is. Cult. Destructive cult. Absolutely. And now has many offshoots, uh, like Ishihara's Ascension, for example. Um, and then you have hopping up and down until you break your coccyx, which is how to fly. But that's going to stop the world from blowing up if 40,000 people do the cities. Yeah, I mean, the world would have blown up by now. It would be gone by now if they hadn't been doing this. Um, it's like the Hopi who, who, chieftain who, who told um, Jung, the psychologist, that he was terrified that in the next generation, the young people would not do the ceremonies that would make the sun come up in the morning. So you can think the Aztecs, oh God, we've got to rip some hearts out, because otherwise you don't want to take the risk, really, you know. So, oh, let's just not do it today. Um, but I was told at the Cult Awareness Network that there were 2,000 cults. I've more recently been told there are 3,000 destructive, dangerous cults. And people would say to me, we'll deal with any cult, Jewish, Hindu, Sikh, Christian, psychotherapy, business, whatever you like, hypnotherapy, whatever you like, but Scientology. And I found in this... media in particular. But, but no, this was with counsellors. This, uh -huh. this was with trying to help members. <laughs> they were saying, and, and my good friend Christian, who had, probably has done all 3,000 of those groups by now, is still a little hesitant before taking on a Scientologist. Because where Transcendental Meditation has two techniques, Scientology has 2,000. But fundamentally, there are only a few approaches, and they're elaborated upon. And what we're going to try and do is to look at some of those, the basic approaches. So we're going to start with training drills, remodeling. Can, can I just add that the whole notion, and from the mental health perspective and the professional hypnotherapy uh, perspective, is that that exteriorization is dissociation, and by definition, is a hypnotic state. And secondly, I want to also state that when someone's in a cult, they're in a dissociative identity. So there you have a cult member in that, that identity with the newcomer, and they're, they're in, in a sense, through osmosis, imprinting hypnotically how to behave properly. Because as you will see, the flunk and the pass and all of that, this is all not just the words and the explicit drill, but it's everything else that's going on, including breathing, synchronization, possibly, etc. Make sure we've got the man on camera. Okay, sorry. That's quite all right. Also, make sure he doesn't fall off the back. Yeah, we don't want you falling off the back. Side. I won't fall off the back. Good. But isn't, aren't they supposed to be closer or not really? Three, three feet okay. is what it actually says. Just standard, checking. standard tech. I should shut up about 
Scientology <laughs> stuff. They know better. <laughs> we know best. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to start with OTTR0 from the 1971 version. This um, technology was developed by Alistair Crowley in the 1940s, and you'll find it in his books, um, and um, then lost. The technology was lost until Aaron Hubbard rediscovered it and decided not to credit it to his master. Um, it's kind of weird, because you get into Scientology, it used to be this would be the very first thing you did, and you've got Hubbard going on about you mustn't have misunderstood words. It's really important you don't have misunderstood words, so here are some new words for you. The day you get in, you've got operating thetan, training so routines. Can I just also say, so the number one technique for inducing trance is confusion, creating confusion. The fastest way to create confusion is to use loaded language, which is a, is, is, is a category of mind control technique, and use the gobbledygook congruently like it really has great meaning. Yeah. And the average person goes inside to go, what the hell does that mean? And for the intelligent person, they get curious. I need to understand what that is. So it succeeds in eliciting a motivational state as well as, as, as that confusion. But when you're confused, you're the most suggestible for being implanted with new ideas. Yeah, and, and you'll see it with hypnotherapists, uh, or stage hypnotists, people like Darren Brown, that they will, they will do something that, that makes you sort of stop and wonder. It, you could use the word mystification as well. So throwing a lot of words at somebody and then telling them they've got to understand all the words, you've got another of those double binds. Um, I, I say this frequently, but Hubbard talked about propaganda by redefinition of words and controlling people by redefining words. The greatest contributor to the English language prior to Hubbard was William Shakespeare. He contributed 300 words to English, including the word factory, which is an abbreviation of manufactory. Hubbard, 300 words, nothing. Two 500-page dictionaries. But the significant barrier to study and understanding is the misunderstood word and he is giving them to you all the time. What's more, he's giving you complex redefinitions. So if you look up some words, they have three or four quite different definitions, and you don't know where you're going. So for example, he tells us it's a tough universe and only the tigers survive, and then he tells us that a tiger is a useless staff member, which it's mystifying, it's confusing, it's a double bind, and it means because you can't make a decision you will become the infant waiting for the parent to tell you what to do. Okay, so OT. Exactly, well said. Thank you. Yeah, words are, are illicit states of consciousness. And in the real world, we want to learn and grow, and we use words to help us cope and, 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 and adapt and be successful. In cults, words constrict and only feed the cult identity. And, and one of, the, one of the, the, the tricks, the biggest trick, as you were saying, is the study tech where they're getting these very intelligent people to buy into this falsehood that they don't understand what's real, therefore they need to keep studying the words so they'll know what truth is. And what is really happening is they're programming themselves into the ideology of the cult. And you're looking at the detail, not the picture. Um, Hubbard in Scientology 8, 8008 lists major contributors to his thinking. He would later deny that anybody had contributed anything, uh, that all of the contributions were minor. But um, back in 8008, in the early 50s, one of the people he um, attributes uh, technology to is Count Alfred Korzybski. And Korzybski is extraordinarily important to the understanding of Scientology, because Kozybski understood that language affects behavior. And he said, the map is not the territory. The word is not the thing itself. And what Hubbard managed to do was to manipulate that systematically, so that you start thinking that the map of the world that Hubbard is giving you is reality. Indeed, he said, agreement is reality. And that meant if you agreed with Hubbard, you were experiencing reality. Um, all right, position. <laughs> Student and coach sit facing each other with eyes closed, gentlemen. If we could close our eyes. Um, a 
comfortable distance apart, about three feet. And the purpose is to train the student to be there, not be here, by the way, be there comfortably and confront another person. Now, this word confront has just been slipped in with no question about what it might mean. To confront another person, not to face them, not to look at them, to confront them. Now, you're confronting somebody with your eyes closed. That I find confusing. Um, well, you have to surrender. Exactly. By, and, by being obedient, by doing the behavior, you're already changing the thoughts and the emotions by, by agreeing to do the behavior. And when I first demonstrated this to a room of the top uh, hypnotherapists in the world, they said, that's trance. That's hypnosis. I said, that's right. No, they were amazed. I, I said, but they don't call it hypnosis. They call it communication. Yeah, and this is, <laughs> this is, your, this is your first moment. You don't know these people from Adam. You've sat in a room full of people with your eyes closed, and that means that in an animal sense, what you've done is you've surrendered what's called boundary perception. So you are no longer in a leading position. You are no longer in a position of an individual. You have accepted that you are part of the herd. You have accepted direction, and that you can trust the environment you're in. It took me years to realise that. Um, so. The idea is to get the student able to be there comfortably. Now, these guys were already here before they closed their eyes. What, how are they being here more by closing their eyes? Um, so the confusion is, it's just run in on you. You don't think about it. I, I remember first doing this and you, fine, I do it. You know, you don't think about it. And it's modeled, right? Because the cult member is saying, this is what I learned that was great. Check it out. It's going to help you be so much more effective in your life. So the, the member is selling it as a good thing. Absolutely. And you're not going to do anything other else but be there. That is, you're not going to breathe. Well, you have to a little bit. OK. You're not going to think. Do you need to think? No, well, the, my thinking. understanding is the, the, the cult member is going to say flunk or pass if the person's fidgeting and not doing the external behavior well, properly. The, so the course supervisor, of course, because both of you have got uh, your eyes closed at this point, the course supervisor may take that. Would you like to open your eyes again, gentlemen? Now, what you're meant to do is have a major stable win. How do you feel? Oh, my God, so much better. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a question to ask you, though. Is, as a former member who did this technique, in this context, is, is there any difference hearing us talk while you were doing it? Well, no. I mean, you're normally in a classroom environment where you're doing drills like this, there's other people doing other drills and talking and stuff like right, that. Right, but you're not in Scientology anymore, and you're at a conference where we're exiting. You mean it was I sitting here doing the drill? Yeah, right now. No, was was there any my, no, difference? I was listening to you guys. Okay. And in, in the course room, you'd probably be listening to the people around you too. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it says here that um, you'd be there comfortably and confront. Did you feel you were being confronted, Christian? Oh, that's, that's poor, Chris. Yeah, I, definitely a flunk on my part. Yeah. It was, well, well I, I ask that as a, as a question as it's happening, that a lot of people in cults have postural states, whether you're in a cult where you're kneeling on your knees or you're twirling or whatever, and we, as an ex-member, they never do that posture again because it brings back the cult of associations, which of course, in the therapy world, what we want people to do is re de anchor and to reassociate the states so they're not avoiding ever kneeling on their knees or doing it, and you want to be able to sit comfortably and do some self-hypnosis or relaxation and have not a wisp of the cult association, ultimately, I think. Well, sitting here like this is certainly a TR position. Right, but what I'm, what I'm putting out there as an idea, I'm not talking covertly, I'm talking about <laughs> very overtly as a, a, a recovery technique to do the state thinking about this is a hypnotic technique that I can do ethically on myself if I want to relax and not have a wisp of that, but just for the future be able to feel good 
and access a state of consciousness and have access to crit crit critiques of this of how it was done back then so that you can be free. It, it gets very complicated that people will go and do meditation and they'll go, wow, that's fantastic, I felt so relaxed. And you get that they've maybe never sat still before. They've maybe never concentrated on their breathing and made sure they were breathing slowly before. And it does feel good and that's okay. But it's not necessarily meditation, it's not necessarily a spiritual practice, it's relaxation. And in our culture, everything's grabbed at and rushed for. So, this can happen. I mean, I found, uh, I had a friend who was an acupuncturist who wanted to, to play with people and was learning how to do it. And the first time I went, she said, right, you lie down here and you lie down here and, and you do this. And it was incredibly relaxing. And when I then later talked to other people who'd had, you know, an osteopathic chiropractor, various things where they were asked to lie still, it was that thought, well, you don't normally do that. And there is something, in fact, in surrendering yourself so that you're not the one having to think about it or do anything, there's somebody else in the room who can do that for you. And in animal terms, and I think we have to think in animal, animal terms, given that we're only, what, 1.7% genetically different from a bonobo or a chimpanzee, that, you know, whether we think we're spiritual or not, we are animals. And there are certain things that are physiological. If you sit still with your eyes closed, you're relaxed, but you'll also hand over control. And now, this is done when a student can be there comfortably and confront and has reached a major stable win. Now, I, I'm going to tell a slightly funny anecdote here. Uh, when I left Scientology, I started going to talk to people who were members, who, who were, had doubts, and uh, I think in, in six weeks, uh, I saw 38 people left that I talked to over the first six-week period. Um, and I went to see this one woman, I'd never met her, and um, I explained what I had to say about Scientology, you know, possibly it was corrupt and things were going wrong and I'd got everything ready and I was very serious and I really didn't think I was getting anywhere because th there was no change in her expression at all. And I thought she was just going to ask me to leave, but she looked up and she said, does that mean I don't have to do it anymore? And I said, yes. She said, oh, good. Then I found out she'd been in Scientology for 15 years and she'd never got past this drill because she did read what it says, and she said, how do I know it's going to be stable? How can I know doing something in the moment? So she's the only person I've ever met in Scientology who said, no, that doesn't make sense. But she was traumatized. Her husband was, you know, what they call in Scientology, a gung-ho Scientologist who went on to OT levels and all of this. 15 years, she keeps going back and the Scientologists are a bit annoyed with her because she paid five pounds 15 years before and they couldn't get any more money out of her. <laughs> TR0 confronting. Here's that word again, confronting. And when you say Scientologists, oh, you sit and stare at each other. And they go, we don't stare at each other, we confront each other. Now, this is meant to be training for counselling, right? You get this idea when somebody comes in and they want a bit of help, they want a bit of therapy, and you confront them. Um, there are no commands. I always loved that word in Scientology, command. Um, the student and coach sit facing each other a comfortable distance apart, about three feet. So nobody knows this is going to be done when you're recruited on the street. And right? you're told it's a communication course. Right, but by, by agreeing to do this, you're already subjecting yourself to an unethical, pyramid-structured, authoritarian cult that has designs on breaking you down and building you up in the image of the leader. And the only choice is to get up and leave because if you want to succeed, as every smart person wants to compete and go through the levels and get a, their certificate or whatever, you're going to stay. And the more you stay, the more they start programming you with the proper words and behaviors and emotional states and trance states. And you're in what Robert J. Lifton would, would call a, a milieu control, uh, peer group pressure, whatever. D to, to get up and leave when a room full of people are doing something is actually quite difficult. Um, I mean, I had a situation where I was called by a Jungian therapist who said, I went to this course, and after about 10 minutes, I said, but this it was co-counseling. This is Dianetics. And everybody in the room said, shut up. You know, let's, let's just hear what they've said. But she's saying, but this is, it's a cult. No, 
just let's hear what the guy's got to say. And she, was, she had a doctorate. You know. At the end of the day, the evening, she found my number, she phoned me, and she was in tears, simply because the group would not allow her to dissent. And um, she didn't get up and walk out, which is what I tell everyone if you ever find yourself in an environment yeah. where people and didn't that, represent what was really going to happen and you're uncomfortable, use your free will and say, wait a minute, this isn't what you told me. I'm out of here. And you'll probably bring other people out with you who <laughs> were feeling exactly the same thing. And if you don't feel strong about it, don't argue. Just leave. Yeah. Um, so to train a student to confront a pre-clear with auditing. Now, I've been in Scientology about five minutes, and I'm being given this thing. I've, I've had OT. I've had to go and word clear OT, operating theta. Now I've got to word clear pre-clear, and I've got to word clear auditing. Having this, you know, misunderstood words are the, the only reason the person gives up a study, apparently, or becomes confused. Though there are other reasons, as you find out later, but that's one of Hubbard's things. This is the only reason, and here's another one. Um, are we boring you, Chris? Ah, it's a misunderstood word. <laughs> uh, dope off. Um, the whole idea is to get the student able to be there comfortably in a position. Now, that immediately implies that before this, you weren't able to be there comfortably. You've never been there comfortably in life. Presupposition and hypnotic language. Uh, in a position three feet in front of a, a pre-clear. Now, we've gone from about three feet to three feet. I've never seen them actually use a tape measure. I'm, maybe that's where they've been going wrong all these years. Um, oh, no, that was three foot two. I actually pulled out a ruler once. Oh, uh, OK. Supervisor. We've got one. We've got one here. I actually did that. There's one in every crowd. Um, yeah. To be there and not to do but anything. But for those who have never done this before, is the course supervisor might say, Chris Flunk, you fidgeted with your knee. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So there, there are actual, we, we'll, you know. We'll get to oh, the okay, text. Sorry. It's all right. Sorry. No verbal tech, okay? <laughs> uh, we have student and coach sit facing each other, neither making any conversation or effort to be interesting. Are you trying to be interesting? I, 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 yeah, sorry, stop, stop it. I'll yeah. stop right now. Yeah. Have them sit and look at each other and say and do nothing for some hours. Now, I remember first reading that going, for some hours. That's quite interesting. Now, some hours became two hours when it got to the form of this, which is called blinkless TRs. And we see Hubbard said, somebody's introduced this blinkless TRs, where you're not meant to blink for two hours. And they used timers between 1970 and 74, a two hour timer. And people would fall off the chair. You know, they'd have these awful headaches. They'd have these terrible things. But Hubbard's complaining. Somebody's introduced this thing which says you don't blink. But here we are. Student must not speak, blink, giggle, or be embarrassed, or anaten. We're really in deep. We've now got an actual analytical attenuation, and another Scientology word. So, you know, I th by my count, that's five terms within about 10 minutes. Um, so, if you gentlemen, if you could just sit and. I don't want you staring at each other, I want you confronting each other. And while they're doing that, I want to point, don't look at me, look at him, Sorry. flunk. <laughs> Dear. Um, I came to Scientology from the Zen tradition and had learned Zazen meditation. So I was very used to the idea that if you confront something fixedly, you will start to hallucinate. That's a fact. And anybody that doesn't has something wrong with their eyes or their brain. There's nothing in there about that. There's no explanation of that. If you've never meditated and you sit doing this and the person in front of you's face changes color and starts wobbling, you might think you're having an experience. Well, you are. That experience is called an altered state. Exactly. And it's a very old hypnotic technique. Hubbard would have known about eye fixation. Yeah. Whether you're fixing uh, your attention on a spot on the wall or on a candle or on a watch, usually not a moving one. Your eyes are meant to scan. So when you, when you fix, you're altering your state of, atten of attention and awareness. This is one of the most important, possibly the most important technique in Scientology because there is a subtext. When you sit and audit a pre-clear, you're meant to do this to them. It's supposed to make them feel more comfortable. 
in the military and the police, making fixed eye contact has been taught for decades as a way of dominating a person. If you look at predatory animals, my cats do it, they stare at things. And the rabbit kind of goes... <laughs> so again, there's an animal physiological thing going on here. More than that, it took me about six months after I left to stop doing this. And I noticed something very strange. I noticed that I noticed a lot more by not doing this. I could tell you a great deal more about somebody's physiognomy by you know, normal movement of my eyes than I could by doing this. Because you're looking, yeah, that's a flunk, Christian. I was waiting for this because <laughs> the trouble is I've got contact lenses. Oh, and so I, 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 think we'll, I think we'll, can we give them a round of applause for being so? So I would just want to add, the moon, in the Moonies, we didn't do that technique, but I was taught that, that people's eyes were the windows of their souls, and that if you wanted to make contact with their spirit man, you had to imagine a line three inches into their skull about there, so you would look at them like that. So it was, you know, just look through them. And so when I met Scientologists and I met members of the Church Universal and Triumphant when I was on the Oprah Winfrey show and there were 50 of them staring at me, I was like, oh, you want to do the eyeball thing? I was trained to do that too. Let's rock and roll. Let's see who can hold it longer. So anyway, but it's a very common technique. The this. most significant thing about this technique is that it induces an altered state. And Scientologists, one of the things, it's like Conway and Siegelman, they looked at other groups, thank you, and they looked at a thousand cult members and 33 of them were Scientologists, and they said, oh, if you're in the Moonies, the Krishnas, three months, six months after you leave, you'll be fine. Scientology, 12 and a half years. <laughs> and why is that? There has to be a form of reinforcement. There has to be a way of maintaining the state. This is it. You confront the universe. You don't participate in the universe. You isolate yourself from it and confront it, and you maintain this state. You, and you maintain the state in the sense that you are a good, dedicated Scientologist with a gleam in your eye, is that the term? You, mean to, you have to be in good, good posture. Uh, but I want to add something that John said. It's not just that you're inducing an altered state of consciousness, it's that when you do that, you're more suggestible to indoctrination and influence. So more beliefs, more manipulation can be done. Let's, let's, yeah, let's quickly do bull bait because that moves us on to the... Actually, just as, a, just as a point, the word confront actually is a loaded word in Scientology because it's used throughout the promotional materials and throughout the technology, not just with this drill. For example, their whole uh, shtick on confront and shatter suppression is, is, part of their, is part of their thing against, you know, enemies of the church. You're supposed to confront them and deal with them head on, right? Of course, the Scientologists all hide whenever a suppressive person comes around. If I went to a Scientology facility, literally, they couldn't get into closets and run away from me fast enough. But, but the materials of Scientology say you're supposed to confront that and you're not really dealing with life if you can't confront it. That word is used all throughout Scientology. And again, Lifton speaks of thought terminating cliches. So that for the Scientologists, they don't have to think about how to solve a problem, they have to think about how to confront right. a problem. That's right. Uh, we're into Bull Bay. The difference here is that we do the TR zero, but we abuse Christian. The whole idea is to get the student to be able to be there comfortably. I, I am here um, in a position, you know, I don't need to give you money for that. Uh, three feet in front of the pre-clear without being thrown off, distracted or reacting in any way to what the pre-clear says or does. Um, da -la -la -la. Anything added to being there, which is of course a Peter Sellers movie, which actually is relevant to what we're doing here. Um, <laughs> is sharply flunked, sharply flunked, Chris. No mild flunking by the coach. Twitches, blinks, sighs, fidgets, anything except just being there is promptly flunked with the reason why. A student coughs, coach, flunk, you coughed, start. 
This is the whole of the coach's patter as a coach. Um, patter is a confronted subject. The coach may say anything or do anything except leave the chair. The funniest one I saw was because you have um, clay or plasticine, as we call it in England, in a course room, this, the, the coach was sat next to the plasticine and while the person was sat there not moving, fashioned a penis and testes and put them... <laughs> didn't actually touch the person, you know. But I, I've seen some pretty harsh, abrasive, um, emotionally abusive, sexually abusive things happen in, in these sessions. Um, All to train conformity and obedience. Because if you comply with this, it sets you up for more and more and more levels of abuse. Student passes when he can be there comfortably without being thrown off or distracted or react in any way to anything the coach says or does and has reached a major stable win. So um, abuse him. All right. So here's zero bull bait. Start. Flunk, you left. Start. I'm still laughing. No, flunk, you didn't start. Start. So, Christian, is that what that says? Christian? Did you forget your name today? Funk, you laughed. Uh, yeah, I'm easy. Okay. I think we get the idea. Now, you just keep doing that. All, like, you can just do that for hours. You just make stuff up. You just like observe things about the guy and you just start throwing it at him and trying to find whatever buttons he has, whatever thing he'll react to, and you just keep going on it until there's no reaction of any kind. And isn't it true that at some point they would be saying to the new person, uh, so Scientology's a cult, you know, your, 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 your parents are coming after you. That's what I heard. Is that I mean, you might they, use they that. They would program but... the person to be non-reactive when their parents I, I don't or think, their I don't think there's a determined thing to do that. You, you, might, you might, at some point, somebody might intrude that, but um, th there it's is not, no... not uniform. No. no. There's the, the whole point, actually, at least how I was trained, is it's very individual to the person, right? So you're going to, like, find his buttons. Now, if he, say, uh, was that we knew that there was a problem with his parents. Right, if he came you back know. and he said, oh, my mother, sure. Nan, says yeah. we're, we're a mind control cult, yeah. then how would he then be he handled? Might, then he might be drilled on that. Yeah. Right, so yeah. the drill would be to hold the, oh, yeah. the look yeah, yeah. and not react. That's right. Right, so that's the point I'm trying to say is that, that part of this creation of the cult identity is made in relationship to in, in, in protecting the cult identity from the influence of the family and the friends, right? Because I was programmed to think my family was Satan, so everything was redefined, so I was taught how to interact with the evil outside world. That and there are, however, specific auditing processes that would be used if that happened. You'd be given a potential trouble source rundown, which has all sorts of goodies in it to make sure that you could handle or That's disconnect. That's very important that families who have loved ones in Scientology understand how systematic the cult is at programming people to resist normal Healthy oh, interaction. This, this would be one of the lightest grade things that would be done in the case of antagonistic parents or relatives or something to prep somebody up for that. There's a whole slew of, of things that get done. When I uh, became involved in 1975, uh, this guy came in and, and he did various drills and was a lovely guy, got to know him well. And I went off to St. Hill and when I came back to Birmingham, he was gone. And uh, 30 years went by and I got an email from him. And um, he said, oh, I was involved actually for 11 months and um, I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. But I used to get very anxious and I did the TRs and it was incredible because I stopped being anxious. It was wonderful. Then I realized that I'd stopped having any emotional effect at all. I didn't respond to anything. Now, this is great, but 30 years later he's telling me, and I still don't. So just doing this drill, just this far in, the five pound, ten dollar course, this guy lost 30 years of his emotions. I'm very happy to say, we, we just actually just 
sent some emails and a month or two later I said, do you want to come and talk to me and um, we'll see what you can do? He said, no, I'm, I'm okay now. I think we've <laughs> sorted it because he put it in its place. He'd understood what had happened to him. But it, it's the thought that this is just the mild beginning of Scientology. Imagine what it's like when you get to OT8. Right, uh, but the, the point is, is that pe people can have some cult program inserted them leave the group for a long time, it can impact them in a negative way for the rest of their life, or it could be just a time bomb where they get a trigger or a stressor and pop, and they go back to the cult. The point is that anybody who's done Scientology, unless they get very lucky, will be trapped for the rest of their life in the programming. And the first stage... That Unless going, they do the work, the, the first, homework. The first, the first stage will be denial. <laughs> the amount of people I've met, the hundreds of people I've met, who've got bizarre behaviours, which are evidently Scientological, who will tell me, no, I'm out of it now. I, I don't believe it. It's a heap of shit. I'm gone. And they use all the Scientology they jargon. They use Scientology words, or they'll still believe in all of the ideas and concepts, but have relabeled them. Oh, I don't believe in the overt motivator sequence, I believe in karma. And you say, is that karma vipaka? And they say, what are you talking about? You say, well, you've gone and looked it up, haven't you? You do know that karma means action, and vipaka means reaction. No, they haven't bothered to look at Buddhist or Hindu's text, Hindu texts. They've just shifted over what Hubbard said and said, oh, that sounds like karma. They'll believe in reincarnation. Well, if you're a Hindu or a Buddhist, you will speak of the fear of the eternal return. And as a Buddhist, I can, former Buddhist, I can say that the most terrifying thought I have ever had was that idea that you're going to reincarnate and reincarnate forever the, on the wheel of suffering. To the Scientologist, it's like, oh, I'll be able to do it in my next lifetime. So I think I'll jump out of a window because yeah. it sucks so bad right and you now. You do indeed get many sort of suicides where people are going, oh, well, uh, I'll just pick up another body. You might okay. not. Okay, let's t yep. t take a break now. Is, is Christian under any penalty or anything? <laughs> yeah, he's going to stay here because, yeah. you know. Sorry, Christian. Really... <laughs> um, this is tone 40 on an object. And um, Len, um, actually, before I go on with this, Len buttonholed me and pointed out that with the training routines, you don't just do it once. You do hundreds of hours of this stuff. And you keep redoing it, redoing it, and redoing it, all the way through Scientology. That's a hypnotic technique, by the way, repetition. Yeah. Repetition, and monotony, rhythm, back from the mimicry, 20s. fixation, over, confusion. over, over, over. Yeah. Auditors are supposed to do it daily. Yeah, and auditors should do it daily. I mean, the first nine months I was in Scientology, I did training routines every day, um, probably for an hour or two each day. I got quite good at it. Um, and, we have a couple of relatives of Ron Hubbard in the room. I'm not going to point to them, I'm not going to let anybody know, but one of them took me aside and explained conversations he'd had with his father. And, and I said, Well, we're going to be doing some stuff next, which it says on the official bulletin, L. Ron Hubbard, but it was actually done by L. Ron Hubbard Jr. And the, the story about it is that um, they were doing this congress in Washington and they had some rowdy students. And so L. Ron Hubbard Sr. said to his son, Work out some way of controlling them. And uh, this is the one. I don't have an ashtray, actually. Isn't that daunting? You want to try this? Oh, look at this. Yeah, we can use that. Innovation. I'd like to thank Spike Robinson for making jokes. Um, making ashtrays stand up since 1957. This is normally done in a separate course room because lunacy belongs in a separate <laughs> portion. Um, again, in terms of the loaded language, tone 40, that means <coughs> intention. It means uh, being able to just, tone 40 is the top of the Scientology tone scale, or it's top of one of them, there's one that actually goes to 800, but we won't talk about that, um, which is serenity of beingness. And it always used to interest me that tone 40, as it came from Sea Org, mem C -Org members, was more like rage. You know, there was no <laughs> serenity involved. So, turn 14 on object, commands, stand up, thank you, sit down on that chair, thank you. These are the only commands used. I'm going to feel silly doing this. Uh, feeling silly is not permitted. I That's know. a flunk. Student sitting in chair, facing chair, which has on it an ashtray. Yeah, normally he'd be sitting here facing the ashtray, but since we're doing it this way, yeah. this will suffice. Squirreling. 
Yeah, totally squirreling this. Coach sitting in chair facing. I got the squirrel to prove it. <laughs> right down. <laughs> Coach sitting in chair facing chair occupied by student and chair occupied by ashtray. <laughs> Whatever that means. To make student clearly achieve tone 40 commands, to clarify intentions as different from words, to start student on road, to handling objects and people with postulates. We're now, this, you know, this, you, you might only have been in Scientology for three or four days and you're suddenly being thrown into this stuff. Uh, postulates, this is, a, this is one of my favorite redefinitions on Hubbard's part. A postulate is a basic philosophic premise for anybody who you know, wants to get clever about it. I don't. Um, but it actually means a wish. And you persuade people, yes, yeah, like this, you can make wishes and the universe will do what you want. <laughs> but by Wait a minute, it, isn't that called the secret? Isn't yes, it, it becomes a secret. Magical thinking. Yep. And one after another. This not your whole Renge Kyo and you can yep. get a Porsche. Oh, yeah. that's Soka Gakkai. That's Lord, a different you, cult. Sorry. A Mercedes Benz. Mm -hmm. um, to attain obedience, not wholly based on spoken commands. Why didn't I realize when I first read this what was going on? TR8 has begun with, and it's this number eight, which is always magical for her, but it's infinity stood up. Um, TR8 has begun with student holding the ashtray, which he manually makes execute the commands he gives. Under the heading of training, stress is included the various <coughs> means of getting the student to achieve the goals of this training step. During the early part of this drill, say in the first coaching session, the student should be coached in the basic parts of the drill one at a time. First, locate the space which includes himself and the ashtray, but not more than that much. So locate the space in which you are and the ashtray is. Tell us when you're there. Exactly. I'm here. Good. Uh, second, have him locate the object in that space. It's there. Where? There. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> Third, have him command the object in the loudest, oh dear, Christian, <laughs> in the loudest possible voice he can muster. <laughs> this is called shouting, thank you for that spike. <laughs> that's, that's in the room. That's, yeah, I believe you. The coach's pattern would run something like this. Locate the space. Right, so, which we just ran yep. through, locate the space. Locate the object locate, in the uh, space. Locate the object in the space. There. Good. Command. Command it as loudly as you can. Yep. And your command is stand up, thank you. Sit down in that chair, thank you. Those are the commands you give the ashtray. Yep. And you make the ashtray do it as you're giving it the command, okay? Yes. Good. So, command it as loudly as you can. <laughs> flunk! 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 <laughs> flunk. <laughs> All right. Command it as loudly as you can. Stand up. Thank you. Sit down in that chair. Thank you. That's good. Good. Very good. That would be done for a really long time. Should we carry on until everybody runs out? When shouting is completed, then have the student use a normal tone of voice. Um, with a lot of coach attention on the student getting the intention into the object. Stand up. Thank you. Sit down in that chair. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I mean, you would normally do this over and over again until the coach is satisfied that you're doing it properly or you can't speak anymore. So um, this is conditioning, programming, mind control. Change the behavior, you'll change the thoughts and the feelings. The new beliefs are being implanted with the loaded language. And the person's complying, not realizing he's going to be asked to sign a billion-year contract. Exactly, when we're all done. Uh, next, have the student do the drill while using the wrong command. Come yeah. again? Like, like you could give it a command like um, roses are red. Okay. Oh, I, Those oh, are I the see. words you use. So you can say sit down you, on that chair and pick it up. Right. Yeah, you could give it backwards. Uh, whatever you say, but your intention has to be and I still acknowledge the thank you that's right but the, even the acknowledgement the thank you has to be different words yeah, you could say uh, Johnny good burger right <laughs> or lolly polali and then you know, whatever whatever words come to mind right okay good start eat spaghetti change your glasses 
fly across the room. Tie your shoes. Good. That, that's exactly how it would run, just like that. This is a, net, a, a, a hypnotic induction. That doing because you're dissociating where you're keeping the cult intention and your words are different. They're, they're creating a split of consciousness. Yep. Absolutely. Weird. And next, have the yeah. student do the drill silently, putting the intention into the object without even thinking the words of the command or the acknowledgement. Think you can do that? Because we will be checking your mind to see if you're thinking it. Give me a moment. Great. I hope everybody felt his intention there. Yeah, but what you were saying, Chris, is this goes on for hours. This typically. goes on and on and on. Like, it, by the time we got to this point, we would have been sitting here all day. Yeah. You know, between the shouting and the normal tone of voice and then the wrong commands and then this. You know, he, he'd be in a frame of mind where he was yeah. just lightning bolts into that thing of intention. And now, to go through that, Chris bull baits him while he's doing it silently. And he says, start and flunk. And that, that's what goes on. So I do this silently. Yeah, you do it silently. While you're nattering at me. You. That's right. OK, ready? All right, start. I don't see any intention there. Flunk. <laughs> start again. OK, start. I don't see any intention there. Man, your intention is, I, that's like tone three and flunk. <laughs> Anyway, so he would yeah. do this until he, until he didn't have any reactions to anything I was saying. And it says that you do it until the drill is flat, which means there'll be no reaction at all. So you're continuously being dissociated from your own emotions. Um, I did these drills with a, a, a professional actor um, who actually married Bette Midler. So I don't think that me giving the drills is associated with that anyway. Um, and he's the only person in nine years of coaching people on these drills who had no reactions whatsoever at any point. And I kind of went away and I remember seeing a, an interview with Peter Sellers being there again. And Peter Sellers was complaining that he didn't really know who he was because he filled parts. And it made me think, maybe this is something that's happening to us, that our identity is being shifted so that we don't have our own emotions anymore. And that was what was happening. Very important point. And it brings up the whole idea of scripting and that identity is normally a set of scripts internally generated about who we are, that we're a man, that we're Jewish, that we're an American, that we're this or that. And that if you recode the part and play the part and then forget who you were before, you become that new identity. It's another way of thinking about it. It is. Um, we're having to race through a little bit, um, but <laughs> I can't resist this one. Um, so, oh, God. Yeah, we, we'd like, okay. Christian, we'd like you to think the thought, I am a wild flower. I'm sorry, you know it's in my head right now. The producers, Mel Brooks' yeah. film. Springtime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, this is terrible. Yeah, think one. the thought. I'm and what do you want me to do at the same time? No, just, just, just think, think the, thought. the thought. I am a wildflower. <laughs> Got that thought? Yes. Good. <sighs> Weird. Okay, good. So now, think the thought you're sitting in the chair. Just, okay. Good. Now, imagine that thought being in the ashtray. Okay. Good. Now, imagine that ashtray containing that thought in its substance. Got it. Good. OK, now get the ashtray thinking it is an ashtray. <laughs> it's having trouble with this. Got one. it. Good. OK. Now get the ashtray intending to go on being an ashtray. Okay. Good. Okay. I think the ashtray is having a problem with that one. 
Now get the now get the ashtray intending to remain where it is. Yes. Good. Have the ashtray end that cycle. Finish that off. I don't understand. Oh, have like you just had a, you just had the ashtray think a whole bunch of things and intend a whole bunch of things, right? Yes. Good. So now have the ashtray finish that. It's done. Get the ashtray thinking that it's done with that. Done. Good. All right. Now put in the ashtray the intention to remain where it is. Yes. Okay, good. Good. So the whole idea of that is to get the is to help you with the drill to differentiate between, you know, putting an intention into something and you know it's a little mental exercise to try to get you to to see but the difference my, between those. But two. as you're doing it, I'm learning. And what that's doing is setting people up for body thetan beliefs. Yeah. Right? Taking part of your consciousness, projecting it onto an inanimate object, projecting meaning into that. It's just the total setup for the, the increment of the indoctrination of the later right. stages. Skip to and just to say it. Anyone who isn't in Scientology listening to this stuff goes, what the? What? If I can just comment as well. People standing and doing this. If I can just comment as well, I found myself thinking in terms of con being able to extend that control outwards on other, in other situations. You know that this is this is something you can do to other people. Right. And objects. And objects, of course. But people. Get very busy kind of getting all the things around you. to say on the continuum, things. this is not normal or healthy. Oh. <laughs> really? Um, oh. Really? OK, moving on swiftly from ashtrays. Yep. And we're very sorry for what we did to you. Oh. We have a relationship. Oh. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, have a quick crack at the book one auditing method. Now, in 1951, Hubbard cancelled this method because he says a pretty clear after he closes his eyes will begin to flutter his eyelids. This is a symptom of the very lightest level of hypnotic trance. So is Dianetics hypnotic? According to Hubbard, it is. It was cancelled in 1951, reintroduced in 1977. This is the 1988 version and um, Chris is going to help us through it. All right, so we're just going to go through the steps of this. You just okay. go along, OK? OK. All right, good. So, um, so you're going to know everything that happens while we're going through this procedure, OK? Mm -hmm. OK, good. So look at the ceiling. When I count from 1 to 7, your eyes will close. You will remain aware of everything that goes on. You will be able to remember everything that happens here. You can pull yourself out of anything which you get into if you don't like it. Ready? Ready. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, just close your eyes. I have to? Yeah. Yeah, you have to. Oh, yeah. Close your eyes. You're told. All right. In the future, when I utter the word canceled. Okay, I, let me interrupt yeah. because this is one of the most standard hypnotic induction techniques taught. Look at the ceiling, slowly flutter your eyelids close. And it's usually practice in the ethical way about breathing. You know, take a breath, look up, let your eyelids close, then exhale. And as you do, you become more relaxed and comfortable and enter into a very, com very comfortable state of trance. This exactly. is the technique that was used by Freud in the 1890s. He'd studied with Charcot in, in Paris, the hypnotist. And he used this technique. And he did not recognize it as hypnotic, the counting technique, all of it. Um, however, he did point something out, which is quite interesting, which is he abandoned the technique because it didn't do any good. He said that while it made the person you were doing it to feel euphoric, it didn't have any therapeutic benefit. And it increased the transference, which is to say it increased the dependence of the client, patient, upon the analysand, or whatever you want to call them, the analysand upon the psychoanalyst. And I would also say that we don't have the time, but hypnosis has undergone a revolution over the decades 
away from a direct suggestion and a command authority thing of your eyelids are getting heavy, heavy. And if the person doesn't trust the hypnotist, they're going to be like, no, I'm, my eyelids are not. And then they were labeled non-suggestible or non-hypnotizable. But the reality is, is very few people are not hypnotizable. It suggested perhaps 10%, but 90% but right. are fairly Most regular. people are hypnotizable, but it's more about how it's happening and who's in control and whether there's a sense of safety. And those words that the cult members are taught to read are meant to relax the person. You're aware of everything. Don't worry. You won't be asked to do anything that you wouldn't ordinarily do or whatever. But that's kind of just nonsense because people can be made to do all kinds of things they would never normally do exactly. in trance, as we all know. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll continue here. So I got the guy with his eyes closed. So I say, in the future, when I utter the word canceled, everything I have said to you while you're in a therapy session will be canceled and will have no force with you. That's called a post-hypnotic suggestion, <coughs> by the way. Yeah. In the future. I'm making you a suggestion that you won't react to suggestions. Get with that one. Any suggestion I've made to you will be without force when I say the word canceled. Do you understand? Yes. Excellent. All right. We're going to find an incident in your life of which you have an exact record. Then, by sending you through it to the moment it happens several times, we're going to reduce it. Now, I would just like to say Please. that that kind of uh, thing in Scientology, or that kind of like telling the person what's going to happen in the session, kind of sets them up for making sure that that's what happens in the session. Does that make right. sense? I, I use the phrase expectation, conditions, experience. Okay. In, in, in Scientology, they call it a, uh, a reality factor, an R factor, or something, you know, you're telling the guy what's going to happen next. Or they just use the word indoctrination. And then within the, the double bind is that within the auditor's code, it says never evaluate for the pre. Exactly. It's, it's wild how they get away with that. So, okay, so now I've told you what's going to happen. Okay, here's the first command here. So, locate an incident that you feel you can comfortably face. Okay. Excellent. Go to the beginning of that incident. Got it. Okay, good. So tell me what you got. I was about six years old. We were going for a trip to the shore uh, for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Could you tell it to me as though it was happening to you right now? I can. Excellent. So that's a trance mm -hmm. state where you're going back in time to reassociate so the person isn't in this space and time. That's another absolute hypnotic technique. Exactly. Called age regression. Mm. I'm sitting in the back seat of the car with my brother, and we're squabbling over our chess game, and we're getting louder and louder, and my father says, you're making so much noise that you really have to stop, or I'm going to turn the car around and we'll go back home. And we stop for a bit, and then we start arguing again. And finally, we were arguing so loudly, my father says, this is your last warning. If you keep doing that, I'm turning the car around. And I don't believe he's going to do that because we're all looking forward to this trip to the shore. And my brother and I start arguing again. And all of a sudden, my father turns on the indicator on the car and we swerve off at the next exit and we turn the car around, and we're going home now again. And my brother, who's eight years older than I am, is saying to my father that it's okay that he'll stop. We're going to put the chessboard away, and he'll stop. And I'm crying by this time, because I really wanted to go to the shore. And my father says, we'll go to the shore next week. And he, that's all he says about it. And we carry on driving home. We're just unpacking the car, and, and I'm really upset still because I was looking forward to that, that trip. And we go in the house, and that's the end of it. Okay. And you would keep going through that and 
you know, we're rushed for time, so yeah. I'm, I'm we we're going to leave yeah. leave you in the middle of that, Christian. You can come back to the room yeah. now. Yes. Yeah. Cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So um, we would actually keep going through that incident over and over again, picking up any other details he can give me, and keep recounting it until he reaches a state where he feels cheerful about it. That's the whole point. I'm actually quite cheerful about it now. Yeah. Well, you're so. not cheerful enough, so we're going to keep going through it. Would you like to test? And then uh, we might find another incident, do the same thing over and over again. And this whole method methodology is using an out of date, but in the time that Hubbard came up with this stuff, idea about the human brain and the human experience, that if you go back through a neg an, an experience over and over, you, it's like your mind is like a battery and it loses its charge. And that is not how the mind works. And it is, a, it is not a, an effective technique if you want to heal from any past trauma. It re-traumatizes the person to the numb and dissociated about it. Um, in fact, there's a technique called debriefing that, that was pretty thoroughly discredited in the 1990s and has changed all of counselling. The idea was immediately after something had happened, you would sit the person down and get them to recount it, to debrief it. And what was found, that people this had been done to were left with PTSD, whereas people who had just not asked anything had a better recovery. It's changed all of counselling, this notion of... And the perversity is, in Dianetics 55, published in 1955, Hubbard explains this. He says that telling people to go through traumatic incidents traumatizes them. And then he's sort of, well, okay, let's do it anyway. <laughs> um, we'll avoid the, um, the modern version of that, routine 3R. Excuse me, he has to, he has to undo all of this and cancel it and everything I canceled it, weren't you listening? I mean, yeah. Well, he's, you can cancel it too, don't feel no, like that. No, you guys can't cancel us, he has to cancel it. Um, all right. No, no, I got it, okay, so. Cancelled. Okay. Okay, good. Weren't you supposed to count me out so I could open my eyes again, by the way? Uh, oh dear, picky, picky, picky. You it's can't just, see it. You, you can't be the case supervisor of your own case. It's against oh, the Hubbard rules. did it. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm just quickly going to look at this and I'm going to have them do something else that's fun in a minute. Um, these are grade two processes, which was, I, I was a class two auditor, I could do this. And it's funny, look, we looked at them on the plane coming over. And um, there are really some quite unpleasant things in here. You know, you've got think of something this person has done to you, think of something this person has withheld from you. And every time you're asked a question, you have to go inside to locate something. Yeah, Age and by doing that, every time. you're going into an altered state of consciousness. And if you think of the continuum, if it's done with an ethical therapist who has your best interest at heart that wants you to get better and get out of therapy, it's going to have very positive effects. And if it's done by a cult that has an agenda to keep you dependent and obedient for eternity, it's going to make you worse and more dependent and obedient. But the techniques, many of them are not bad in and of themselves if they're used honoring the person's unique, authentic self, empowering the person to have locus of control, which cult members think they are doing by joining the group, that they're learning self-determination and blah, blah. It's just, the, that's the lie. There is no good way of doing OT3, though, just in case you're thinking. Th this is the process... OT3 doesn't exist. It's doesn't? a construction exactly. of a crazy person. O OT3 as a process does exist. Sorry. That it didn't actually happen is another thing, but it does exist because Aaron Hubbard invented it or stole it from a science fiction writer. I, we found, we were sat on the plane coming over and reading through these, we found this thing where you get the person, get the idea of terminal, uh, depersonalization, we, we have objects, not people in Scientology, get the idea of a person having done something to you, get the idea of someone having withheld something from you. So you're actively getting somebody saying, get the idea of your mum doing something nasty to you. you know, you're actually moving into the imaginary process. I just wanted to point that out, that you've not only got recollection of real incidents, which will very quickly get into false memories, because you believe, like, and now think of something is there an earlier similar incident? Is there an earlier similar incident? And you're meant to recollect things that happened in past lives. Now, I've said this before many times, but my experience as an auditor, I became somewhat skeptical because I'd talk to people and say, what did you do yesterday? And they go, um, um, what did you have for breakfast? Um, and you say, what did you do a trillion years ago? Oh, I was on this spaceship and, 
you know. And there's also, you're encouraged to just say the first thing that comes into your head, um, which is not really very healthy. Right, we're going to do... Hey, oh, just as a short comment on that. Sure. Because you had given me the, those papers beforehand, I you was able to answer you when you asked me for an incident. But otherwise, I would have been sitting here. It took me about probably 10 minutes to come up with something yeah. at the time because I have, in fact, gone through most of my life all the things that would, would normally be important. And there's nothing really there. But well, at least to I, do that for you. At least I got hold of this thing, which we could use. But otherwise, I would have, been, I would have had to either make something up or... I don't know, going to sit here for half an hour scrounging around in my memory. And, and, and if that's what, it, in, in a real dynamic session, if that's what it had taken you to recall something, I would have sat here patiently yeah. waiting for you to recall it. I mean, I wouldn't have been like, come on, talk about yeah. that. I mean, you get the idea it's that, not that, that, that I, I, I think so. Jim would have been saying, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, no, of course, I'm just saying. You yeah. can be doing five, six hours a day of this every day of the week until there's nothing left to you. We now have to move out of the way and let them do this performance here. Oh. I found you a bottle. Oh God, a All right. And this book, this book would not normally be used in the session. <laughs> but they're going to demonstrate what is called opening procedure by duplication. It's called opro by dupe. Notice that word dupe in there. If, if you want to stand at one end and yeah, you together. Stand over here. Now you'd have done all of your, your training routines and you've learned how to control another person. Uh, with tone 40 intention um, and with 8C, which is infinite control. And it will be physical. You will make the person do this thing. I, in nine years in Scientology, um, the, the Hubbard said that you can always tell the suppressive by how fat their ethics folder is. My ethics folder had two knowledge reports in, in nine years. One of them was just before I left Scientology that I complained that they weren't following policy to my doctor, who was a Scientologist, she reported me, so much for the confidentiality of the medical profession. Um, but, but I wasn't saying anything nasty. I was saying, oh, have you seen this policy letter here? And it, they don't seem to be following it, which to me seems to be a good thing. The only other knowledge report in my folder was to do with this procedure. When I, shortly after, I, about six months after I got in, I audited this on a guy, and I gave him five two-hour sessions of this. And afterwards, I said to a friend, that was the most boring thing I've done in my life. And I got a knowledge report. You'll see what I meant. Take it away. All right. So we're just gonna, I'm going to give you commands and just run through this process. OK? okay. Good. So look at that book. Thank you. Walk over to it. Thank you. Pick it up. Thank you. What is its color? It's blue. Excellent. With what some is white. its? OK, good. What is its temperature? It's about room temperature. Okay, good. What's its weight? Maybe about a pound and an ounce or something like that. Okay, good. Put it down in exactly the same place. Two hours. Thank you. Look at that bottle. Two yes. hours? Thank you. Walk over to it. Thank you. Pick it up. Thank you. What is its uh, color? It's transparent, it's got a white cap, it's got a blue and white label. Excellent. What is its temperature? A little bit cooler than room temperature. Okay, good. And what is its weight? I'm bored already. <laughs> Ten Maybe hours. A pound. Okay, Maybe good. Less. Put it down in exactly the same place. Okay, thank you guys. Good. Back and forth, back and forth. For two hours in a normal session. Um, Programming it, obedience. Absolutely, and if there is any resistance, <laughs> you physically control the person to do it, which would not be considered ethical in most counseling disciplines. But this is an entry point. This is an extremely important procedure because this is the first procedure you will do, or process as Hubbard called it, where you are meant to exteriorize. And what generally that means, and I've interviewed hundreds of Scientologists, in and out of Scientology, probably about a thousand, about exteriorization, because it is the goal of Scientology. And people will tell you, you're kind of going, oh, they'll float off around the room and they'll give descriptions and all this thing, and you'll expect, you know, this is going to happen. The only person, I've, I've had a couple of people who've described so-called out-of-the-body experiences, none of them actually as a consequence of auditing sessions. Uh, there was a time when Otto Rose told me that he saw the the Apollo split in half, 
but I think that's called hallucination. Um, that's a hypnotic phenomenon. There's absolutely. Positive hypnotic um, hallucination and negative hypnotic hallucination. Positive hallucination is anything in the five senses. That you see something that isn't there, that's called a positive visual hypnotic phenomenon, something you hear that isn't there, that's an auditory hallucination. Negative visual would be like if I'm being interviewed by a TV show, I'll negatively hallucinate the TV cameras so I don't get nervous, so I won't see them. Yeah, you blank, blank something out, that you, you see something that's not, experience something that's not there, or you make something that is there disappear. It's an there, altered there, state of consciousness technique. It's much safer and cheaper ways of doing this, it's called taking drugs. <laughs> um, but I would argue there are positive uses that are ethical for hypnotic phenomenon, like if you are a golfer and you need to hallucinate the line that the ball is going to go to get in on the curve of the grass, you're going to want to hallucinate the line that you should be putting. And there are many other examples, free throws in basketball, I visualize it going in before I do it. So it's not evil, but you're suggestible to influence an indoctrination. And it's a matter of who's in control. Exactly. What I normally heard when I asked people about addict serialization hundreds of times was that they felt as if they were out of their body. So when I saw a psychiatric definition of depersonalization, I was a bit shocked because all of the sensations that are listed as you know, this beneficial exteriorization are actually considered an aspect of psychosis by psychiatry. And I think that's a good point to end on. <laughs>